Okay. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do an interesting, hopefully interesting teaching on Passover. This is going to be a teaching on Passover. I couldn't think of a short title for it. I thought I would call it Passover and Chag Hamatzo Q&A because we're going to deal with a lot of questions that people have and giving the answers to the questions that they have. Um, the, shorter quest, answer, you know, the shorter title I was going to put on it was, you know, everything you wanted to know about Passover but was afraid to ask. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that people have in terms of Passover that I want to deal with. And it was a challenge putting this teaching together, not so much in terms of getting the answers, but in terms of how to piece the verses together. Because unfortunately, a lot of the verses that I want to use to answer one question also answer three other questions in the same verse, or they deal with multiple things in the same verse. So what we're going to try to do is actually take this more chronologically, starting in, Ex in Exodus chapter 12. But one, I want to just give you a little bit of an idea of what we're hopefully going to accomplish today. And this may end up being at least two parts. I don't think it'll be three, but I think we'll get it done in two. Um, part, what, part of what I want to cover here is what is the Passover? What is the Passover meal? Because they're two different things. Okay, when is it performed? When is it eaten? There's a difference between eating and performing the Passover. Uh, who can eat of the Passover meal? Where is it to be observed? What is the second Passover and who's that for? Um, what about the issues of the Last Supper being a Passover or not? So we're going to really try to cover a lot of these controversial and important issues that a lot of you probably face and deal with on a regular basis when you start dealing with the Passover. So let's begin in Exodus chapter 12 and Shemot chapter 12. And we'll start right there at the beginning of the chapter. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to read some of the verses. As I'm doing it, I'm going to point out if you're dealing with a when, a what, a how, a why, or a where, or whatever it is. And so you might want to note for yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, you may want to note for yourself that that verse is dealing with a why issue, or a where issue, or a who issue, or whatever it is. Because, like I said, trying to put all of the when issues together got to be redundant reading the same verses for more than one thing. And so let's begin in chapter 12 and in verse 1. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aharon in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This month is the beginning of the months for you. It is the first month of the year for you. Okay, so first of all, this is the setting of the calendar. And it's obviously dealing with when. He says, so this month is the beginning of months for you. It's the first month of the year for you. Now, as a side note, I encourage you to compare that to Leviticus, Vayikra chapter 25, which is talking about the Shemitah year, in other words, the seventh year rest, the sabbatical year, and the Jubilee year. And it says that that calendar starts with the month that has the Day of Atonement in it. And so there are more than one calendar that are being used in the scriptures. The one that the feasts are based on, the, the calendar that we calculate feasts on, begins with the month in which you find the Passover. But just understand that we made the point that there's actually two calendars running at the same time in Scripture. One for the sabbatical years, one for the feasts. Let's continue. So verse 1 and 2 tells us that this is going to happen in the first month. Verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, each one of them is to take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Now, I'm going to read all the way through, say, verse 11. But before I do, notice starting in verse 3, it actually deals with who. Who is this instruction to? The congregation of Israel. This is not instructions to the general public. We're going to deal with that a lot more as we get to the end of chapter 12. But just note that it starts by saying, what I'm about to say is to the children of Israel, the congregation of the children of Israel. And so that's what we have to understand, that this is all instructions for Israel. It is not for the general public. Put that in the back of your mind for later. Verse 4, and if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of beings. According to each man's need, you make your account of the lamb. Let the lamb be a perfect one, a year old male. Take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then all the assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. Okay, so now, we're getting here in these verses, and we're seeing that there's going to be this lamb that has to be picked up. 
And it's going to be a community thing. So if you have just a person by themselves or just a husband and wife, that may be more than you need. And we're going to see that that's important because later one of the instructions is going to be that whatever is left over needs to be burned. You don't leave it till morning. And so your goal here was to pretty much not have extra. So if you knew, hey, a whole lamb is going to feed you know, so many people, and you're only half of that, well, then you might want to find other people to share the lamb with. So continuing, and then it says in verse 6, it says, and you're going to keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and all the assembly of the congregation of Israel is going to kill it between the evenings. Okay. So let's stop there for a second. So on the 14th, we're going to see this. On the 14th, you're going to kill this animal between the evenings. This phrase in between the evenings is simply the Hebraic way of saying afternoon. I know people want to argue and they get into all kinds of you know, deep study into what they think the Hebrew language is. Well, look, you're not going to be able to study the Hebrew language by, by, by parsing out each word and know what a phrase means. You have to actually go to a Hebrew to find out what a phrase means. From time to time, you're going to miss the idioms or the phraseology. The two words together for between the evenings is used to mean afternoon. How do I know that's the case? Well, we're going to prove that later because Yeshua died when? The ninth hour, which is in the afternoon. That's between the evenings. And generally, that means from noon until sundown, between the evenings. And so this is, again, an idiomatic phrase that means afternoon. So all the assembly is going to come and do that. I want you to consider that that's going to be talking about what we're doing, because we're going to have two things happening here. You're going to have the performing of the Passover, which is the killing of the animal. Please note that down. The performing of the Passover is the killing of the animal. And then there's going to be the participation in eating of the meal, which is a separate thing that happens later. Because after you kill the animal, you're going to cook it. After you cook it, you're going to eat it. But there's going to be a reference to performing the Passover as compared to the eating of the Passover meal. These events, believe it or not, don't happen on the same day, even though they happen several hours apart. Because now we're going to be into the 15th. I know it's stirring up a whole bunch of stuff, but let's follow it through from the verses. He says, And they shall take some of the blood, verse 7, and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh on that night... So in that afternoon, they kill the animal, and that night, they're going to eat it. Well, that night is now the next day. So the killing was done on the 14th. The next day is now the 15th. So the meal is eaten on the 15th, which we're going to see is actually also the first day of unleavened bread, which is why we're going to be told here that you can eat it roasted with fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They're going to eat it. Why are they eating it with unleavened bread? Because the days of unleavened bread has begun. And so that's the eating of the, that's the, eating of the meal. And so we're starting to work on some timing issues here. The performing of the Passover is going to be the slaughtering of the animal. And then the eating of the meal is going to be later that day, which will be now the nighttime, the after sundown, into the next day. Okay? Continuing. He says, do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and all of its inward parts. And do not leave it until morning, and what remains of it until morning you are to burn with fire. This is why they're trying to be efficient with selecting out a lamb for just the right number of people. Okay, so, verse 11. And this is how you're going to eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of Yahweh. Now, we're going to read all the details of this, but understand, why do they have their sandals on, their loins girded, and their staff in their hand? Because they're going to be leaving. And they're not leaving in, in, in 36 hours or 48 hours. They're going to be leaving within that time cycle of eating the meal, then the death angel comes, and then they're going to have Moses to be told to leave, and they're going to leave. And you're going to see that all play out, because we need to realize that there's a lot of people out there teaching error here in terms of the timing of these things where they stick an extra day. There's going to be people that sneak this extra day in there that they, they sort of had the Passover, then there was a whole day, and then they didn't leave till the next day. That is not the case. There's no haste if that's happening. 
They were girded and ready to go with their sandals on. You know, look, I have kids. A lot of you have kids. If you don't have kids, you were a kid. And you know what it means when your parents say, hurry up and go get your shoes on, we're leaving. Because kids will be all goofing off and doing whatever they're doing, and they know until they have to get their shoes on, they're not actually leaving. You have to tell them, go get your shoes on because we're leaving. Well, that's what Yahweh's saying to the people. Look, you're leaving. Go get your shoes on. Get your staff in hand. You're going to be leaving. Let's continue. Verse 12. He says, And I shall pass through the land of Mitzrayim on that night, and I shall smite all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both man and beast, and on all the mighty ones of Mitzrayim I shall execute judgment, I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I shall pass over you, and let the plague not come on you to destroy you when I smite the land of the Mitzrayim, the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall become to you a remembrance, and you shall observe it as a festival to Yahweh throughout your generations. Observe it as a festival, an everlasting law. So what's happening in verse 12 and 13 is we're finding out what Yahweh did during the first Passover. But it only happened then. This is another important thing we're going to see very clearly from the verses. But they only did the blood on the doorpost and the lintel that one time. Which also, by the way, Yahweh only passed over with the killing of the firstborn that one time. But yet we read in verse 14 that we are going to now have a memorial, a celebration of remembrance to this event. So after this event, every year was going to now be a memorial remembering the event. It was not a reenactment of the event. They were not going to have to be girded with their loins and their sandals and their staff, and they weren't going to have to put blood on the doorpost. Yet there are people in this country and elsewhere that are still doing this. They think the, the, the scripture requirement is to literally go ahead and keep putting blood on their doorposts. This is not only an error, it's actually a sin, because we're going to find out that you are not to do that, and we'll see that in a later verse. It's actually going against the commandment. It's not just a wrong interpretation. Let's continue. So now we know a little bit about what Yahweh will be doing during this, and we also know a little bit about why. Remember I said we're going to talk about when and why and you know, what and how. You know, the verses about the Lamb was a lot to do with what we're doing and how we're doing it. This last verse is here about the Passover, was what Yahweh was going to do, and then why we're doing it as a memorial. Then we get to verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Indeed, on the first day you cause leaven to cease from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that being shall be cut off from Israel. All right, now, let's look at verse 15 for a second. There's several words in here in the Hebrew that you have to understand the meaning of so that you understand what's really to be taken out of your house. Anybody ever, and I don't need a whole lot of comments, you can raise your hand, but do you ever have a problem or confusion knowing what exactly you're supposed to not have in your house? Well, we're going to answer that today. How nice. There are, Hebrew is first the thing you need to understand. The word here for unleavened bread is matzah. So for seven days you are to eat matzah. That's actually what the Hebrew word is, matzah. That is unleavened bread. But we are to cause the leaven, the Hebrew word there is seor. Seor. Leaven to cease from our houses. For whoever eats leavened bread, leavened bread is chametz. Okay, from the uh, Ashkenazi, it's chametz. Okay, chametz or chametz. Depending on how you pronounce the vowel there. Separate word. From being, he says, from the first day until the seventh day, there is to be none of this in your house. Now, several things are going on in this verse. First of all, let's define seor and chumetz. Seor is leaven or that which is used to leaven. It's the leavening agent. It's that which does the leavening. So seor in that days of the Israelites was a little piece of the dough from the previous loaf that was allowed to ferment that they held on to to go ahead and leaven the next loaf. I hope we're clear on that. They didn't have a jar of yeast or a bag of yeast that they put, picked up at the local Publix or whatever your store is, okay? At the supermarket. They would take a piece of the leavened bread from the previous loaf and use that to seed the next one. But then where did they get the leaven to start with for the first loaf? There's leaven in the air. Just leave the bread out, it will leaven. That's why they had to, in haste, there was no time for the bread to leaven. 
Because they had to bake it in haste. Leavening takes is a process of time. There's enough leaven in the air. So they literally could not get every bit of, quote unquote, leaven out of their house. But what they needed to take out of their house was the leavening lump. And we're going to see that verse in the you know, New Testament talk about burying a piece of the, of the leaven or the lump that we're talking about. A little lump, you know, leaven's the whole lump, a little bit of leaven. And so that's the seor, the leavening agent. Chametz, or chametz, is something that already is leavened. It has already risen. It has already had the leavening process complete itself. So we're told you are to cause the leaven to cease from your houses. So you're not to have any of these little leavening lumps in your house. And also, you're supposed to get rid of all the stuff you've already baked that's already leavened. Stuff that's already risen. That's what the chametz is. Now let's be clear about this, and we're going to look at it in other verses. Let's look in, in verse 19, because I'm just going to look at These are all verses where the word seor is. So we know where, where it's talking about with seor, that which leavens. Verse 19 of chapter 12, for seven days no leaven, no seor, is to be found in your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened, that same being shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether sojourner or native. Now, the seor... Is what they're saying here is, look, if you don't have the leavening agent in your house, you wouldn't be tempted to leaven anything. But let's be clear again, it's the sour fermented piece of dough that they've had over. They didn't have a jar full of yeast. I know we've got this obsession with getting yeast and everything else out of the house. It's not about that. There's yeast in the air. You can't get rid of all the yeast. It was this leavened piece of bread. It's really all about the bread. Because if we understand metaphorically, Yeshua is the bread of life. We're supposed to have the unleavened bread of the word. Okay, it's the leavening of the metaphor, the fullness of bread. It's all about bread. It's not about beer. It's not about anything else that could have leaven in it. It's about the bread or baked goods, cakes, cookies, that kind of thing. It's not about you know, peripheral thing that may have been made with yeast. Let's continue. Seor, chapter 13 and verse 7. We're going to stay in Shemot here. Chapter 13 and in verse 7. Unleavened bread is to be eaten the seven days, and whatever is seor leavened is not to be seen with you, and the leaven is not to be seen with you within your border. Okay, whatever has that seor, and leaven is not to be seen with you within your border. They're talking about this leavened lump. Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 11. Leviticus chapter 2 and in verse 11. No grain offering which you bring to Yahweh is made with seor, for you do not burn any leaven or any honey in an offering to Yahweh made by fire. You see the consistency? We're talking about a grain offering that has been leavened. It's not talking about any other type of thing. It's talking about grain offerings. Let's continue and look at um, Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 4. And no leaven should be seen with you in all your border for seven days. Neither should any of the meat which you slaughter in the evening on the first day stay until night until morning. So again, no leaven is to be seen with you. It's talking about the leavening agent here, which has been the lump, and then we're also talking about that which is leavened is that which has already risen. Let's look at chametz verses. This is the words, or chametz, or chametz. You have to, excuse me, I'm Ashkenazic, so it's chametz. Okay, let's go back to Shemot chapter 12. Shemot chapter 12, Exodus 12. And let's look at verse 20. Do not eat that which is leavened in your dwellings. So you're not to eat anything that's already been leavened. That's the chametz. Let's go to verse 33. And the Mitzrites urged the people to hasten to send them away out of the land. Oh, excuse me, I'm in the wrong place. Um... Why did I have that verse there? 
34. Okay, so I wrote the wrong verse. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their garments and on their shoulders. So again, now we're dealing with chumets. It had not leavened. Remember the difference between seor, which is a leavening agent itself, and then the chumets is that which has already been leavened. And so they had not had the, the, they were bound up in the garments because their dough had not leavened. It was, excuse me, before it was, it had a chance to leaven. Hmm. When you make bread, it has nothing to do with having chance to leaven. You actually take yeast and stick it in the dough. Here, they would have sat it out and waited for it to leaven. Or put a little piece in and let it then mix with it as it spreads through the dough. But that all takes time. Continuing, go to chapter 13 of Shemot of Exodus and go to verse 3. We're still doing with chametz. And Moshe said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery, for by strength of hand Yahweh brought you out of this place, and whatever is already leavened shall not be eaten. That's Chumet. Verse 7, same chapter. Unleavened bread is to be eaten the seven days, and whatever is leavened is not to be seen with you, and leaven is not to be seen within your borders. That's got both of the words in there. Let's go to chapter 23 and verse 18. We're still in Exodus, chapter 23 and in verse 18. I know I'm beating this to death, but this is a hard question for people to understand that, you know, when you look on most Jewish websites, you're going to find just the idea of getting rid of the chametz. The chametz. Well, we're also to deal with the seor. None of them ever mentions the seor. What the seor is, the seor is the leavening agent. Chapter 23 and verse 18. Do not offer the blood of my slaughtering with leavened bread. In other words, that which is already leavened, chametz, and the fat of my offering shall not remain until morning. I hope we're getting the point here. I don't need to necessarily read any more verses, but just so that you understand what we're dealing with, leavening agents versus something that's already leavened. Now, when we talk about leavening agents, personally, I don't think you need to go and throw out all your yeast and all the other things that are leavening agents, baking soda, whatever because that's not what they were doing or using. Their leaven was coming out of the air. It's not talking about the yeast itself. It's talking about the lump that was used for leavening. Because if you had the lump, you'd be tempted to stick it in a piece of bread. I mean, in the flour, the dough that you would make unleavened bread with. Now, if you cook the unleavened bread quickly enough, it won't get the yeast out of the air. So they're saying, we don't want you to have your little seed bread, your little thing that starts the leavening, and we don't want you to leave it out there long enough to get it out of the air either. Let's continue. I want to look at some Brit Kadasha verses, New Testament verses. Go to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 33. Matthew 13 and in verse 33. Because you have to understand what the physical is a metaphor of pointing to. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until all was leavened. So it's like seor, that the woman took until all became chametz. Let's put the Hebrew words in there. The woman took a piece of seor, and, which is a, a, a fermented piece of dough, and stuck it in until all had become chametz. Let's go to Matthew 16, Matthew Jehu 16 and verse 5. Matthew Jehu 16 and verse 5. And his taught ones came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And, Ye and Yeshua said to them, Mind and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Did he say that because we, we didn't bring any bread? And Yeshua, aware of this, said to them, O oh, you of little belief, why do you reason among yourselves because you brought no bread? Do you still not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you picked up? Or the seven loaves and the 4,000 and how many large baskets you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They then understood that he did not say to beware the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now let's understand, the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is not referring to when they taught Torah. It's referring when they were teaching their own doctrines, the doctrines of men. So let's not just say just because the Pharisees and Sadducees taught Torah also, that they were talking about everything that ever came out of a Sadducee or Pharisee's mouth. 
That is absolutely not the case. He's saying the teachings of them, not when they're teaching my stuff. They're teaching when they're teaching their own stuff. Beware of that because it bears hypocrisy. It's full of hypocrisy. Okay, now he says here, beware of the teachings, and he hasn't said anything about hypocrisy yet. So let's go to Luke chapter 12. Go to Luke chapter 12. Because I got ahead of myself mentioning hypocrisy. And in verse 1. Luke 12, 1. Meanwhile, when an innumerable crowd of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his tall ones first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So now he's helping you to define what he was talking about in Matthew. Here he mentions that it's hypocrisy. The leaven is hypocrisy. So it's not just that they're teaching things that are against the law or some other thing. It's their teachings that are hypocritical that are the problem. So he's not saying don't listen to their Torah instructions or their talk about the Torah. It's the hypocrisy in their talking that's the problem. They speak but they do not do. There's hypocrisy in what they say. Continuing, he says, And whatever is concealed shall be revealed, and whatever is hidden shall be known. So whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have spoken in the ear of the inner room shall be proclaimed on the housetops. But I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that are unable to do any more, but I shall show you to whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after killing, possesses authority to cast into Gehenna. Yea, I say to you, fear him. So now we're finding out that the hypocrisy had to do with them saying one thing and thinking they would do different things in hidden, in hidden places. Because if you read the flow, you can see that there's a context going on here. The hypocrisy is now being linked to this idea of trying to conceal stuff. Oh, you say don't do this, but then you go ahead and you do it in a hidden place. You put on a good front, you talk a good talk, but you don't walk the walk, but you don't think anybody's noticing. But he's saying, hey, it's going to be revealed. Whatever you're doing is going to be revealed ultimately. So don't think that your hypocrisy is going to get you anywhere. So let's continue. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the entire lump? Therefore, cleanse out the old leaven so that you are a new lump, as you are unleavened. For also Messiah Passover was offered for us. So then, let us observe the festival not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, it's all about the metaphors of the bread and the hypocrisy in how we apply the bread, the bread of sincerity and truth, the bread of the Torah. I am the bread of life. The bread is the word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. This is our bread. Give us our daily bread. So everything is about the symbolism of bread. So do I think you need to get a whole bunch of other stuff out of your house? We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But mostly, let's realize, absolutely, we're dealing with bread and bread products. It's about the bread Let's continue. As we're looking at these things, as we're laying this all out, and we're seeing about the chumets, let's understand that Jewish tradition, now I'm going to take my brothers up on this a little bit, but I want to make sure you're receiving it in the right way. There's no problem with the Jewish tradition to avoid all grain products that could be used to make bread and those kind of things. So they do. They avoid the five major grains during Passover, except when it's being used to make matzah or anything out of a matzah product like matzah meal, etc. So is that breaking the commandments? No. It's their tradition. The problem is when they elevate it to Torah. That if you break that tradition, now you're breaking the commandments. The tradition for them to avoid all these grains is nowhere in the scripture. We read you every verse just about that says, Seor or Hametz. I left out a few more verses, but they all say the same thing. They're dealing with the bread. There's no mention of the different grains. There's no mention about it being wheat or barley or rye or spelt or anything like that. What matters is, is it being used to make bread that is leavened. So the Jewish tradition to avoid all these things is simply a tradition. And if you choose or if they choose to do more than is required, there's nothing wrong with that. Let me say that again. If you choose in any commandment to go further than the commandment says, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't give other people grief who are not. 
because they have not seen it the way you see it. And so you can't create Torah. You can't add to the word. There's not one verse that lists any grain by name in this problem. In other words, in terms of leaven, leaven bread. It's, it doesn't matter what grain it is. If it's leavened, it's a problem. But the problem is it has to be leavened, whether it's barley or wheat or flax or whatever. It doesn't matter. Only matters is whether or not it's leavened. So can you have pasta or other things that are made out of flakes and stuff? In my opinion, absolutely, if it's unleavened. These are not problems. You can also have all those other grain products as long as they're not leavened. That's what the verse is talking about. And so let's keep that in mind. Again, I'm not attacking or judging anybody who wants to go further. Please do. Just have room for the people that don't to understand that they just don't see it that way. And the verse doesn't back up doing it that way. It's just your way of being more conservative or wanting to maybe be in line with your Jewish brothers. This, that's perfectly well and good. Just like in Mark chapter 7, the disciples were accused of not doing this hand washing thing. There's a ritual called nitilat yadayim, where you pour water once on the left and once on the right and once on the left and once on the right. They weren't doing it before eating these, the grain that they were eating. It was bread. It, wasn't, it was bread, bread they were eating. It wasn't pork or anything. But the point was, they hadn't done this washing ritual. Yeshua never says there was anything wrong with the washing ritual. He simply said it wasn't an instruction of the Torah. It's important that we understand that. He never said the ritual was wrong, but making it a Torah command is a problem. So he never said, hey, they don't need to do that. Actually, it's wrong to do that. He never says that. So it absolutely was no problem doing that ritual if that's what people wanted to do. But to give people grief for not doing it, he had a problem with that. So the same thing I'm going to encourage you with the Passover and unleavened bread. Some of you are going to take it in an Orthodox Jewish direction. Others will not. I am encouraging shalom in your interactions. I'm encouraging respect in your interactions because you're just interpreting it the best way you can, the way you see. And we have to allow people space. So I want to make sure I encourage that strongly. But actually what the verse says, and I have to be very clear from the mic, what the verse says, the verse never mentions a single grain by name. It simply says bread, that the unleavened, or, or chametz, a chametz is a leavened product. So when the Jews say the chametz is flax and wheat and barley and all this stuff, that's not chametz. Chametz is simply any of those grains once they've been leavened. But they have to already have been leavened. They have to have risen. Okay, hopefully that's clear as mud. Okay, we can go on. Let's continue. Verse 16 in chapter 12. We're back to chapter 12 of Exodus. Let's go back to our launching point. We're in Shemot chapter 12 and in verse 16. So let's continue. And on the first day is a set-apart gathering, and on the seventh day you have a set-apart gathering. The seventh day, excuse me, you have a set-apart gathering. No work at all is to be done on them, only that which is eaten by every being, that alone is prepared by you. This is an important verse. First of all, he says it's a mikra kodesh. A mikra kodesh, that's a commanded assembly, it's like an appointment or a date with the Almighty. So the first day and the seventh day are mikra kodeshim, they're holy assemblies, the commanded assemblies. You are to do no work on those two days, but it does make allowance, and by the way, the, all of the feasts make this allowance, that you can prepare what you need to eat. So you can cook on the mikra kodeshim. You would not be cooking on the Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath, but you can do it for a feast day. Because they want you to feast. They expect a lot of people to be at your house or gathered together in Jerusalem all together. And they, feeding a whole lot of people requires some cooking in a different way than if you're just in your house and you happen to have food that you were able to prepare the day before and that kind of thing. And so not everybody would have the facilities and the ability to prepare in advance. So on a Mikra Kodeshim, on a Mikra Kodesh, a holy day, you can cook. He says, look, only that which is eaten by everybody, that you can prepare. In other words, what you're going to eat that day, you're not making stuff for the whole week, but you're going to prepare what you're going to eat. Because the next day you'll be allowed to cook and you can cook on that day as well. Verse 17. So, now we're, oh, so verse 16 was about how. How are you going to do this? You're not going to work and you can cook. 
on the first and the seventh day. Verse 17. And you shall guard the festival of unleavened bread, for on the same day I brought you, excuse me, on the same day I brought your divisions out of the land of Mitzrayim. And you shall guard this day throughout your generations in everlasting law. On this same day I brought your divisions out of the land of Mitzrayim. This is a part of the when. On this same day. What day? The first day of unleavened bread. We have to get this timing thing down. We argue about this a lot. I see it on the internet. I get it on phone calls and emails. They killed the animal in the afternoon on the 14th. They then spent a good amount of time cooking it over fire. They roasted it over fire. Then they ate the meal after sundown as the Passover meal. Then at midnight, and I know you're saying, well, how do we know midnight? Well, the Hebrew says middle of the night. So I don't know if it was actually midnight, but sometime in the middle of when it was dark, the death angel came and the firstborn were killed. So they ate the meal. Then there was this killing of the firstborn. Then Moses, we're going to see this. I'm, going to, I'm just getting ahead of myself, but just so you know how, where we're going. Then Moses, in that darkness, after the, the firstborn are dead, gets called to Pharaoh, still in the middle of the night. And he's told, I can't take it anymore. You and everybody get out of here. Paraphrasing. And so they do. He goes back and tells all of Israel, let's go. We had our sandals on and we're girded and we're going to leave. Now, they didn't take five minutes to leave. It took a long time to go through the day and do the things that they did. But they left that day on the 15th. He says, in that same day. Let's go and see how this links. He said, by your divisions. Well, guess what? We have a verse in Numbers 33 that talks about them leaving by divisions. Let's go to Numbers. Hold your place here. In, Sh in Shemot 12, in Exodus 12, hold your place. But go to Numbers 33. Bimidbar 33. And in verse 1. Bimidbar 33. And in verse 1. These are the departures of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Mitzrayim by their divisions under the hand of Moshe and Aaron. Isn't that what we just read in Shemot? The day they left by their divisions? He says that Moshe wrote down the starting points of their departures at the command of Yahweh, and these are the departures according to their starting points. So they departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month on the morrow of the Passover, the morrow of the Passover is the morrow of the performing of it, not the morrow of the meal. It's the next day from when they killed the Passover, or you could say on the morning after they had the meal. Either way, it works. It's the next day after they prefer, perform the Passover. Remember, there's two different things, performing and eating. They performed it on the 14th, the next day they left. Or you could say in the morning after they had the meal. That's what the morrow could be talking about there. He says, on the 15th day of the first month, the morrow after Passover, the children of Israel went out with boldness before the eyes of the Mitzrites, and the Mitzrites were burying all their firstborn, whom Yahweh had smitten among them. Also on their mighty ones, Yahweh had executed judgments. So, so the sun rises after all this killing of the firstborn, Moses going to Pharaoh and everything else, and Moses being told they could leave. The Egyptians are now burying their firstborns. And by the way, burying doesn't always mean burying. They're mourning, they're upset, they're crying. It's just like the person said, look, I need to go home. He said to Yeshua, I need to go home and bury my father. Well, his father wasn't dead either. He was old and going to be dying soon. You see what I'm saying? So here it's referring to them, they're mourning, they're lamenting, they're starting this whole process because their children had died, the firstborns had died. And so this is when Israel was leaving. Let's continue. Go back to Shemot chapter 12. And we get to verse 18. Verse 18, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month in the evening. Now, one of the challenges in writing Hebrew and then translating it into another language, especially when we're dealing with time, is that, guess what? They didn't have clocks. Imagine how you're trying to describe day and night, the next day and what day it is, and whether it's evening or morning and everything else when you don't have a clock. Especially when days start at night. It gets to be a little confused. And so we have here, it says, and you shall, in the first, uh, first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, so it's the 14th day of the month, and now we get to the evening, 
and it becomes the time when you're going to eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month when it becomes evening. So you got the 15th through the 21st. But people may read this and go, on the 14th in the evening, is that going to be between the 13th and the 14th? Or the 14th and the 15th? It's the 14th into the 15th. How? Because all the rest of the verses say that. Let's keep things consistent. But they're trying to say night, day, it gets confusing when there's no clocks. We can easily say at 8 o'clock at night, then we know we're talking about 8 p.m. We know what we're talking about. We have a clock. We can say what 8 p.m. is. We know what 8 p.m. is versus 8 a.m. Well, they don't have a.m. and p.m. going on in this case. There's no clocks. So this is part of the when. We get to verse 19. It says, for seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. We read that verse already. Verse 20, we read also already. And we get to verse 21. And Moshe called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, go out and take lambs for yourselves according to your clans and slaughter the Passover lamb. So that's what's going to be done on the 14th. They're going to slaughter that Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip the blood in the basin and strike the lintel in the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And you, uh, um, uh, and, you and none of you shall go out of the door until, of the house until morning. So let's stop there in verse 22 for a second. So he says here, do this lintel thing, and then nobody's going to leave their house until morning. So the initial instruction while they were still in Egypt, I hope you're hearing me clearly, we're not going to have anything changing except that the literal physical location is changing, so certain things are going to change by necessity. Here in Egypt, because the death angel is going to pass over, they're told, do this blood thing, go into your houses, and don't leave until morning. Stay in your house. Why? Because you could get killed otherwise. So the initial instruction was that the Passover meal was to be eaten after they slaughtered and killed it and, and cooked it and everything, and you were to stay in the same house you were in until the morning. Verse 23, And Yahweh shall pass on to smite the Mitzrites, and shall see the blood of the lintel in the two doorposts. And Yahweh shall pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall guard this word as a law for you and your sons forever. Now let's understand, when he's saying, and you shall guard this law as a law forever, he's not referring to the blood, he's referring to everything he had said previous to that, all the way back, you know, whatever, 10, 15 verses. All of this is a law forever. But we're going to find out that the blood thing was the one-time thing. And, and also in pointing out, by the way, when you picture the lintel and the two doorposts, it, it makes the letter chai, or chet, chet, which is life. So it's like they were painting life on their doorposts, which is a very interesting thing to know. So let's continue in verse um, 24. But actually, let's note that verse 22 and 23 were dealing with a little bit of the how, even though it was a one-time deal, and that none were to go out of the house until morning. So it has to do with where you do this. Because a large discussion that I still get into is like, where are we supposed to do the Passover? Verse 24, we read verse 25. And it shall be when you come to the land which Yahweh gives you, as he promised, that you shall guard this service, and it shall be, well, we're going to skip, we're not going to do 26 yet. Okay, when you come to the land, you're going to guard this service, verse 25. So this is dealing with when and where. Let's now go to Deuteronomy 16. Hold your place here. Go to Deuteronomy 16 and verse 1. Devarim 16 and in verse 1. I hope this stuff is making sense for you guys. Deuteronomy 16 and in verse 1. Guard the month of Aviv and perform the Passover to Yahweh your Elohim. For in the month of Aviv, Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of Mitzrayim by night. And you shall slaughter the Passover to Yahweh your Elohim from the flock and the herd in the place where Yahweh chooses to put his name. Eat no leavened bread with it. For seven days you eat unleavened bread with it. Bread of affliction because you came out of the land of Mitzrayim in haste so that you remember the day in which you came out of the land of Mitzrayim all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen within your borders for seven days. Neither should there be any meat which you slaughter in the evening. On the first day, uh, stay uh, with, uh, all night until morning. Let me just see how far I wanted to read this, all the way to verse 7. You shall not, uh, you are not allowed to slaughter the Passover with any, within any of your gates which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. Did you hear what he just said there? You cannot do this in your gates. So you can't do this in your backyard like many are doing and then rubbing it on their, on their doorposts. 
You are not to do this within any of your gates. But, verse 6, at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell, there you slaughter the Passover in the evening, and at the going down of the sun, at the appointed time you came out from its rhyme. And you shall roast it and eat it in the place where Yahweh Elohim chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go back to your tents. So now he's telling you that we're doing it right the way we started doing it here a couple years ago. Is that you're supposed to go somewhere other than your house, do the Passover meal there, and not go home until the morning. You're supposed to stay overnight somewhere. And you're not supposed to do this in your house. So because the one-time deal in Egypt had to do with safety, life and death, it was a one-time deal as far as the blood and staying in your house. Once they left, it was to do it in the place where he placed his name, and you stayed there until morning, and then you could leave. And it never changed from that point. There's never another discussion about any of that since that point. Let's continue. Let's go to Numbers chapter... Bar chapter 9. You should still be holding your place in Shemot because we're going to get back there. But let's go to Numbers chapter 9. I want to point out something important here. Numbers chapter 9 and in verse 1. Bar 9 and verse 1. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of Mitzrayim, saying, Now let the children of Israel perform the Passover at its appointed times. What does perform mean? Killing the lamb. On the 14th day of this month, between the evenings, perform it in its appointed time according to all its laws and the right rulings you perform it. When do you do it? On the 14th, between the evenings. And that's the afternoon of the 14th. And Moshe spoke to the children of Israel to perform the Passover. So they performed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month between the evenings in the wilderness of Sinai according to all that Yahweh commanded Moshe to do. So where exactly was the doorpost and the lintel for them to put the blood on? There wasn't, was there? Because they never did it that way again. They didn't paint it on their tents. They painted it on the houses that they left behind in Egypt one time. Verse 6, but there were men who were defiled for being, for being of a man so that they were not able to perform the Passover on that day so that they came before Moshe and Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, we are defiled for the being of a man. Why are we withheld from bringing near the offering of Yahweh at its appointed time among the children of Israel? And Moshe said to them, wait, let me hear what Yahweh commands concerning you. So first of all, th without getting into too much trying to break down this here about what this means to be defiled. It simply means they had done something that made them tame. Okay, without trying to parse out the idiomatic phrase for the being of a man. Because again, that's a Hebraic idiomatic phrase from 4,000 years ago that we're not necessarily understanding right this minute. But when we see it in its application, it's going to be they had done something that made them unclean, which is ta tame. And so they could not go ahead and do something which meant bringing the slaughter offering because you can't come near or approach Yahweh in the state of Tameh, unclean. So Moses says, look, let me, ask, let me ask Yahweh about this. Okay, so Yahweh speaks to Moshe in verse 9. He says, speak to the children of Israel, saying, when any male of you or your generations is unclean or Tameh for a being or, or, or is far away on a journey, ooh, you see, if he was far away on a journey and it was okay to slaughter the animal anywhere, he could just do it wherever he was. But he's not allowed to do that. He has to do it only in the place that placed his name, which, by the way, is Jerusalem. Now, there's no temple. We're not going to Jerusalem. There's no Levitical priesthood. So we're not slaughtering an animal. So that's part of this that we can't do. Keyword being can't. We can't do any of that. But in a time when you could do it, you could only do it where you were appointed to do it. And so for everybody out there who's listening, who has friends or other people in other congregations that are slaughtering animals for Passover and putting blood on their doors, they are breaking the law. End of story for that. Let's continue here. But now we're going to deal with the second Passover. He says, well, speak to the children of Israel, verse 10. He says, look, if they're unclean, or they're too far away, they can still perform the Passover to Yahweh. On the 14th day of the second month, between the evenings, they perform it. With unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they eat it. 
They do not leave it until morning. They do not break a bone of it. According to all the laws of Passover, they perform it. But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and has failed to perform the Passover, that same being is going to be cut off from his people. You need to be a part of this. Now, let's go to, back to, um, hmm. Now let's go to, back to uh, Shemot chapter 12 and go to verse 26. I'm just looking to see how much we can get done quickly here before we'd have to end with part one here. Chapter 12 and in verse 26. We're back in Exodus in Shemot 12 and in verse 26. And it shall be when your children say to you, what does this service mean to you? Then you shall say, it is the Passover slaughtering of Yahweh who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Mitzrayim when he smote the Mitzrites and delivered our households. And the people bowed their heads and did obeyance. Verse 28, and the children of Israel went away and did so, and Yah as Yahweh had commanded Moshe and Aaron, so they did. All right, so verse 27 and 28, 26, 27, 28 is all dealing with the why. People are going to ask, your children may ask you, why are you doing this? Friends and family may say, why are you doing this? And you say, because. And here it is in verse 27 and 28. This is why we're doing it. It's a memorial to that event. Verse 29, and it came to be in the middle of the night or midnight that Yahweh smote all the firstborn of the land of Mitzrayim from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night. Come on, let's remember the, the timing here. They killed the animal. They roasted it. They didn't put it in the oven to heat, or I mean in the refrigerator to heat the next day. They ate it that night. Afternoon, killed, cooked, that night, eaten. Later that night, death of the firstborn. Later that night, Moses is going to be called here to Pharaoh. Pharaoh rises up in the night. He, he and all the servants and all the Mitzrites, because there was a great cry, for there was not a house where there was not a dead one. Then he called Moses and Aaron at night. Let's, let's refer to this as verses as dark. Dark versus light. Make it a little easier. It's still dark out. Okay, at darkness, and said, Arise and go out from the midst of the people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve Yahweh as you have said. So in the dark, it's still dark out, and he calls Aaron and Moses and says, Look, you guys can go. Get out of here. I'm done. Verse 32, Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go. Then you shall bless me too. And now, look, now we get to verse 33. And the Mitzrites urged the people to hasten to send them away out of, the, out of the land, for they said, we are all dying. And the people took their dough from uh, before it was leavened, and having kneaded their, in their bowls, bound up on their, uh, excuse me, and their kneading bowls bound up in their garments and on their shoulders. And the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked for the Mitzrites objects of silver and objects of gold and garments. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the eyes of the Mitzrites, so that they gave them whatever they asked, and they plundered the Mitzrites. And they, now, when is this all happening? It's still dark. Getting into the early morning. They're going around and asking the Mitzrites for stuff, and they were given favor. Because there are people that say this. They'll say, oh, well, there must have been a whole other day for them to plunder the Egyptians. Well, first of all, let's picture Egypt. A mansion was probably a five-room adobe hut instead of a one-room adobe hut. These places were not like you picture today with these huge palaces where somebody may have to go running around in all kinds of corners looking for their gold and silver and garments. And like you, they probably have it stored in one place. Like you have your stuff stored in a box somewhere in your house. And so it didn't take very long for an Israelite to go to an Egyptian and say, I was told to ask of your gold and your silver and your garments. And they just turned around and gave it to them. It didn't really take a lot of time. Point number two with all that. They were walking out barefoot, not barefoot, I mean on their feet or with carts and animals. They were not getting on a bus or grabbing their U-Haul. They didn't have trailers. I mean, how much stuff do you think they could have carried with them anyway? They were not getting much, some, maybe some earrings or some bracelets or some necklaces or some little pieces of gold or silver, some clothing or garments or cloths. They were not getting truckloads of stuff. Now, they end up with truckloads of stuff when you add up the fact that there were several million of them asking. 
But each person didn't have very much of this stuff. So this is still happening timing-wise in the darkness getting into the morning. And Yahweh had given them favor. In verse 36, he says he gave them favor with the Mitzrayim so that they, uh, they gave them whatever they asked. And then in verse 37, the children of Israel set out from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot besides the little ones. So that's how we know it's about 2 million. 600,000 men, not counting kids and women. And not counting the fact that there was a mixed multitude too. And a mixed multitude also went out there with them. So we're talking probably 2, 3 million people. They also their herds and their livestock were taken with them. Verse 39, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Mitzrayim, for it was not leavened since they were driven out of Mitzrayim and had not been able to delay, nor had they had time to prepare the food. A word that is missing in some of the people that want to say that there's a day between the Passover and when they left. They were driven out. Once the dead, let me rephrase that, once the killing of the firstborn happened and they had dead bodies all over the place, they were like, get out. There was not like, take as long as you want, get out. It was get out. They were driven out. Here they were begging to be released, and now they're not only being released, they're being driven out and handed. Look, take whatever you want, just go. Anybody ever have that happen with somebody where you're just so frustrated with somebody who wants something from you, and you're like, I don't care, just take it, just go. I just want you to leave. In verse 40, and the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Mitzrayim was 430 years. Okay, so we get to this point. So this is giving you a lot of description of the timing of what happened. Timing of what happened. So let's just understand again in, this, in these verses. It says, Moses and Aaron are called to Pharaoh after midnight while it is still dark. Pharaoh tells them to go and take everything with them. The Mitzrayites are urged, urging them to leave in haste. The Israelites immediately grab all their stuff and what the Mitzrayites had given them, and they leave. This is still the 15th. They left on the 15th. By the way, as far as giving them favor, let's go back to Shemot or Exodus chapter 11. I want to read you something. Because it's also possible that the Egyptians had been giving them this stuff prior to this event. It says here in verse 1, chapter 11, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, I am bringing you, excuse me, I'm bringing yet one more plague on Pharaoh Mitzrayim. After that, he's going to let you go from here. When he lets you go, he shall drive you out from here altogether. He's going to drive you out. Speak now in the hearing of the people. Let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor objects of silver and objects of gold. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the eyes of the Mitzrayites. And the man Moshe was a very was very great in the land of Mitzrayim in the eyes of Pharaoh's servants in the eyes of the people. So it's possible because the people were already in awe. They didn't know why Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. They were very impressed with Moses as a leader and with the God of Moses and what he was already doing to the land. I mean, after all, they'd already had nine plagues. And so there's a hint in verses, the first few verses here in chapter 11, that they had already done the plundering prior to the plague of the killing of the firstborn. Verse 4, And Moses said, Thus said Yahweh, after midnight, I am going out of the midst of the Mitzrayim, and all the firstborn of the land of Mitzrayim shall die, and the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Mitzrayim, such as never been heard or ever again. But against any of the children of Israel, no dog shall move its tongue against man or beast, so that you know that Yahweh makes distinction between Mitzrayim and Yisrael. And all these servants of yours shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all your people at your feet. And after that I shall go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great displeasure. So this verse here about no dog shall move its tongue, etc., that also may be hinting at when the Israelites went to the Egyptians and said, Gold and silver and garments, please. They said nothing. They just gave it to them. Because Yahweh inspired that to happen. You know, we can look at this as payment for slavery for a couple of hundred years. Compensation in full. But again, that's verses, I've heard this growing up. I've heard this in church, you know, from people in different churches that there was a day in between. There was no day in between. It didn't take that long to do all of this. They had prepared for it in advance. From the 10th day to the 14th day, they knew what was coming. 
They had everything already packed, ready to go. All they had to do was hitch it up to the, to the you know, ox that was going to pull it or put it on the donkey or put it on their back and leave. It didn't take that long. What took a long time was to get several million people out of Dodge. That took all day. All right, you know what? We're going to end it here because now we're going to get into who can participate and that's going to take a whole bunch of time. So I think this is a pretty good place for us to end with part two, I mean part one, and leave us with a part two. So let's go ahead and go before the Father in prayer. Avino Mokino, our Father, King Father, we are so excited to be studying your word and to be studying about the Pesach, the Passover. And Father, it's our desire that we do things correctly and in line with your instructions, that, Father, will we do what's pleasing in your sight. And we're hoping that in a small way today, we've taken a, a, a small step or even a leap forward in doing that, where we've learned a little bit more about what you want us to do and how you want us to do it. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. We give glory and honor to you. We're just so excited to be getting that much closer to a fullness of understanding. And so, Father, we seek your your, your provision that you give us through the Ruach HaKodesh, the teacher inside of us, that you would instruct and open up our minds, our ears, our eyes, our hearts to receive what you have to give us. Father, we're just so starving for understanding and for knowledge and for wisdom from above. Father, we thank you. Father, we praise you and we love you and we ask all in the authority of your Son, Yeshua, our Messiah, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.